our all-purpose toolkit for both assembling groups together to form products, but also for breaking groups apart to discover normal subgroups and quotients. That toolkit is the short exact sequence. We've previously seen how short exact sequences can be used to think about products of groups, and in this extra we want to look at how short exact sequences can help us to think about quotients as well. So remember a short exact sequence consists of three groups, A, B, and C, a one-to-one -one homomorphism from A to B, call that one G, an onto homomorphism from B to C, call that one F, and what makes it exact is the fact that the image of G is exactly the same set as the kernel of F. Everything which arrives in B from this homomorphism gets sent to the identity by that homomorphism and vice versa. So how does this help us to think about quotients? Well if the group in the middle B here is playing the role of the product, and A in the, in the first place here is kind of playing the role of a subgroup within that product group, then we would say that C, the group here on the end, can play the role of the quotient. So in our short exact sequence of groups, we can think of this group at the end here as being like the quotient of B by A. That's of course only if A happens to be isomorphic to a normal subgroup of B. So in this video we're going to have to convince ourselves that when we have a short exact sequence of groups A, B, and C, that C actually can be realized as the quotient of B by a normal subgroup of B. So the fact that this C here on the end of my short exact sequence is in fact a group should be our first clue as to why we're going to be able to say that A is isomorphic to a normal subgroup of B. So let's start just by thinking of an example. So here's the group A4. All 12 even permutations of three symbols can be written as, as one of these. And we can understand the first row of this table of elements here. Um, notice that this is the identity permutation and all three of the 2 plus 2 cycle type permutations in S4. Um, this is actually not only a subgroup of A4, it's a subgroup of S4. We've previously seen it's actually a normal subgroup of S4. And it's isomorphic to a Klein 4 group, Z2 plus Z2. So we can kind of think of A4 as being my product group, and A, the subgroup, um, as being isomorphic to this Klein 4 group, Z2 plus Z2. And so G is then the one-to-one -one homomorphism that sends these elements to those elements on the first row of my A4 table. Meanwhile then, the quotient of A4 by this normal subgroup is then a group of order 3, which therefore must be isomorphic to Z mod 3. So the factor group or the quotient group that is playing the role of my C in this example is the group Z mod 3. And that quotient map, remember, needs to be an onto homomorphism whose kernel is exactly the same as the image of G. That means that all of my 2 plus 2 cycles and my identity must get sent to the identity in Z mod 3 because they came from the inclusion of the Klein 4 group as the subgroup of A4. And then we'll take everything on this row and send it to 1. We'll take everything in this coset and send it to 2. And that will form my short exact sequence uh, for this example. Right? This image subgroup that I got from G uh, is the same thing as the kernel um, that I'm sending to 0 via the homomorphism F. And the key observation here is that we can define this subgroup here, this purple subgroup that I highlighted, in two different ways. On the one hand, we can define it as the image of the, the group A included as a subgroup of B. So that's it's sort of where it comes from. But the more powerful way to define it is not by defining it as having come from somewhere, but as going to somewhere. In particular, we could also define it as the kernel of the homomorphism F. In other words, the set of all elements of B which are getting sent by this homomorphism to the identity element in C. Because when we define it as the kernel of a homomorphism, that automatically makes it a subgroup, as we can prove. But not only that, it makes it a normal subgroup. So the key observation for this video is that if you give me a homomorphism out of a group B, then I can supply you with a normal subgroup of B, just defined as the kernel of that homomorphism. So the kernel of any homomorphism out of B is always a normal subgroup of B. And that's going to be the key to the correspondence that we have going on in this video. That because F is a homomorphism out of B, its kernel, which is a subgroup of B, actually ends up being a normal subgroup of B. 
And because that kernel is equal to the image of G, because it's an exact sequence, that means that that normal subgroup of B that we get from the kernel of F is isomorphic to the image of G, it's actually equal to the image of G, which is isomorphic because G is one to one, with the subgroup A. So what all of that is a talky proof of is these two points. That first of all, in my short exact sequence A to B to C, A is isomorphic to a normal subgroup of B. And furthermore, C is therefore isomorphic to the factor group of B by that normal subgroup. So let's explore this a little bit further. And the most important bit that I want you to get out of this video is that we can find normal subgroups by finding kernels of homomorphisms, that one of those is completely the same thing as the other. And here's how. If we have any homomorphism out of B, so from a group B to a group C, we can define the subset of B, which is called the kernel of F, and that subset consists of all the elements of B which are getting sent to the identity. So in my example over here on the left, all the elements on this first row are getting sent to the identity element of C by this, this quotient map here. And therefore the kernel of the homomorphism F is everything on this first row. And the claim is that that's always a normal subgroup of B for any group B, for any group C, for any homomorphism from B to C. So this is a general construction that works in all kinds of different settings. So we have to show two things. We first have to show that the kernel of F is a subgroup of B. And then secondly, we also have to show that it is furthermore a normal subgroup of B. First, let's prove that the kernel is a subgroup. Let's use the one-step subgroup test just to make our lives easier. To do that, we have to show why for any arbitrary elements of the kernel of F, any arbitrary elements of K, X and Y, that X times the inverse of Y is also an element of K. It also belongs to the kernel of F. Well, to figure that out, we just have to remember what it means to belong to the kernel of F. Belonging to the kernel of F means that F sends that element to the identity. So our burden of proof now is to show that F of X, Y inverse is equal to the identity element of C. But F is by assumption a homomorphism. Therefore, F of the quantity X, Y inverse is F of X times F of Y quantity inverse. So because of the homomorphism property, um, these two lines are equivalent one to another. But now, f of x and f of y are something that we know about because x and y belong to the kernel of f. Since x and y belong to the kernel of f, f of x is equal to the identity, f of y is equal to the identity. And so if I read this whole thing from the bottom to the top, f of x, y inverse is equal to the product of f of x with the inverse of f of y. But if by assumption x and y belonged to the kernel, each of those were in turn equal to the identity, and so their product is equal to the identity. Therefore, f sends x, y inverse to the identity, so x, y inverse belongs to the kernel of f. That proves that the kernel of a homomorphism out of B is always a subgroup of the group B. Now we need to take that the next step and show why it's furthermore a normal subgroup. To do that, we're going to use this conjugation test, this characterization of normal subgroups. It says that normal subgroups are subgroups that are closed under the operation of conjugation. So I have to show that if k is the kernel of f, that for any element g that belongs to my group b, that g, k, g inverse is a subset of k. To do that, I need to pick an arbitrary element of k and an arbitrary element of my group g, and show that g, x, g inverse must still belong to k. Right, so pick an element from this set, I need to show it must also belong to that set. Well, remember what belonging to the kernel means. Once again, belonging to the kernel means that f sends you to the identity. So my burden of proof is I need to show that f of gx g inverse is equal to the identity element of c. But since f is a homomorphism, f of gx g inverse is the same thing as f of g times f of x times f of the inverse of g. But again, because f is a homomorphism, f of the inverse is the inverse of the f's. And because x belongs to the kernel, f of x is equal to the identity. So using those two facts, I can rewrite this as f of g times the identity element of c times the inverse of f of g. But because of the identity property, this is just f of g times its own inverse. That's equal to the identity. Therefore, when x belongs to the kernel of f and g is any element of, this should be the group b here, then gx g inverse also belongs to the kernel because of this calculation. 
So the whole moral of the story, once again, is that short exact sequences help us to think about quotients, because in a short exact sequence, the third group here, C, plays the role of the quotient of B by the normal subgroup of A. But that raises the question, where does that normal subgroup come from? That normal subgroup exactly comes from the kernel of this quotient map. And so the real takeaway from this is we can always find a normal subgroup of any group just by constructing a homomorphism out of that group and looking at the kernel of that homomorphism. The kernel of a homomorphism out of a group B is always a normal subgroup of B. So on the one hand, we have normal subgroups. On the other hand, we have homomorphisms. And the kernel is what connects the two of those one to another. In our next chapter, we're going to sew all of this together by looking at that going the other way around also, looking at what's called the first isomorphism theorem, which really puts this connection between normal subgroups and kernels of homomorphisms onto a completely firm foundation that's going to allow us not just to undo a product to discover the factor group on the one hand, but also to undo a product to discover the normal subgroup uh, of which it is a product in the first place, to go from homomorphism to normal subgroup and also normal subgroup to homomorphism.